All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the not very regular, but it kind of comes up once in a while, lunchtime uh, discussion. I like to call it warrants a discussion. This is a regular series where I talk to folks about the cool stuff that they're doing. And cool stuff that they're doing is exactly the topic today. So recently on my blog, A Fuse Number 8 Production, I interviewed somebody who adapts graphic novels into audiobooks. I've talked to people who adapt, uh, you know, uh, nonfiction into f in, for adults, into for children. And now we have a case, and this is kind of a rare case, of a graphic novel being adapted into a work of prose fiction, not the other way around, which is absolutely fascinating to me. My guest today is Erica Pearl, who you may remember from her many middle grade books. You have picture books too, do you not? Mm -hmm. I do. Well, yes, like a whole range of books that you do. Um, you do funny books, you do serious books, uh, you do all sorts of things, and you were tapped to, well, why don't you tell us yourself, what was the recent project that you got tapped to do, um, which is absolutely fascinating. What is the graphic novel? All right, I'm glad you asked. Um, hi, it's good to see you. Good, good to see, see you everybody. too. Yeah. I can't see everybody. Good to have everybody here. Um, yeah. Okay, so I, you know, as, Betsy, as you said, I write a lot of different kinds of books and including, a, I've written a bunch of middle grade novels, um, some of which have Jewish content in them. Like these are two of them that are both kind of contemporary realistic fiction and funny books and also have some Jewishness to them. Um, and my editor on those books, on all my novels actually, is a woman named Erin Clark, who I believe you also know because she has edited your work. She yes. has. Yes, and she's a wonderful editor. And Excellent she taste too, I must say, yes. Yes, yes, all... <laughs> absolutely impeccable taste. Um, and she is also the editor of many wonderful people, including R.J. Palacio, who wrote Wonder, um, and many other books, including a graphic novel um, that I hold in my hands called White Bird. Um, and this book, it came out, gosh, which, what year did it come out? I should know that, but um, I'll peek at the copyright page. Pre-COVID, I sort of split yeah. all publications of books into pre and post-COVID. So. I guess, and I'm right. Um, yeah. it, it's written and illustrated by Palacio. It is, I would say it's kind of a wonder adjacent story for those of you who don't know it, um, because it is told, it, it, you, you, you go into the story through a conversation between Julian, the kind of bully character from Wonder, and his grandmother, who is an elderly woman who grew up in France during the Holocaust. And she is telling him a story that first appears actually in Augie and Me as the Julian chapter. Um, and it's about Grandmère's experiences as a young girl in the Holocaust and how she um, she's Jewish and she ended up fleeing the Nazis and hiding in the um, barn of a classmate of hers who actually um, is a, a boy who has polio and who she had not had never paid much attention to and then become, she becomes her best friend while they are kind of going to the Holocaust together. White Bird. So I, I read this book um, when it came out and I loved it. I thought it was really incredible. I actually kind of sat down in a bookstore with it and didn't emerge for a while because I got very sucked into it. It's very, um, very atmospheric and very cinematic. And as it turns out, this is actually going to be a movie which is coming out this fall, um, which is exciting because it is very cinematic. Um, so anyway, long story long, Erin uh, reached out to me. She had been the editor on this book and she said, you know, we have this movie coming out and we want to create another version of the same story um, for readers that may not know the graphic novel or may not have a comfort level with reading books in graphic novel form. Mm -hmm. And so we want to create a prose novel version of it and uh, we need to hire someone to do that because the schedule and timing of Raquel, R.J. Palacio's life, is such that she can't take, take this on right now. And so they asked me to, to work on it with her. Um, and I said yes, because I was really excited to get that opportunity, even though I didn't really know what it was going to look like. So that's how the project came to me. And um, I was thankfully given, this book was actually sort of like small inside basic baseball detail. Um, because she is the author and illustrator of this book, she created it as it is. She did not write a script for it. Um, and so there was no text of the book that existed. 
Oh, well, right. that's interesting. Right. So when I asked, I put the file and just send it on to you and be like, hey, here's all the text and a handy dandy Word document. Yeah. I was ready to start work on it. And I said, great. Can you send me the text? And they said, yeah, about that. <laughs> so thankfully, You're going they to laugh. yeah, thankfully they hired someone else or they got someone on staff to quickly type and they were oh. able to turn over to me the words of the book, which was helpful. Yeah. Um, but short, really short because it's a lot of oh, yeah. So, um, so that was sort of my starting place on the project. So. Okay. So this, that answers actually a question that I had where I wondered how much interaction you actually had with the original author, but yeah. it sounds like minimal. Um, well, I, I wouldn't say that because she was really a guiding force. Um, she, she's wonderful and an incredible person. Um, I had met her before on a couple of occasions. And she made herself available to me to sort of guide the project. Like mm -hmm. I did the day to day, but she was definitely like helped me shape it. And we had, we zoomed and we talked and we emailed and texted and, you know, had a real conversation as the project was going because I really wanted to know kind of, I didn't want to let her down more than anything. And I wanted to know what she had in mind in terms of how it might look. And she was very, um, kind and generous about letting me sort of shape it from there. But the one thing that when we when we initially talked, I remember one thing that, that stuck out was that we both referenced um, The Princess Bride, which has that, it, I know it's a very different book, but it has the same, like it starts with the grandfather and it starts out with, I'm gonna, Ooh. you know, here we are in the present day and okay. now then we're gonna go into the story. Huh. And we liked the idea of, you know, how, how do you tell a story like this? Like I, even I struggled over like, is it in first person? Is it in third person? Who's, you know, are we getting this from grammar now? Because that is how the book starts. Yeah. Or are we go, going into the story and how do we manage those transitions? And so the Princess Bride was sort of like the, 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 the thing that jumped out at both of us as, okay, that could work, that kind of idea where you can, you can be in the present and you can be in the book. And there's a clarity of moving between them but you're able to experience both worlds as as real. Can you so, say which you which version you did? Did you do the story within the story starting with the present day and then going to so, back, or did you start in the past? No, we started. I mean, I tried to be as as, as um, I tried to hew pretty tightly to the structure of the book. It was yeah. not possible to do it at all times. But um, but in the book, you actually you know you start out. I'm mean, just to pull this up. You start out seeing Julian and his grandmother having a Facebook call. And so I did write a scene of that and then move into the story within the story. And I also, you never see Julian and his grandmother again until the very end of the book. I interjected them a bunch of times just because I kind of needed them. Um, very right. Yeah. Because there are things, <laughs> now I get into sort of like the what's hard about it. Like yeah. one of the things was there are things that happen in the book that you kind of learn through voiceover there's a certain amount of, can, oh. I, can I share my screen? I, that might help. Oh, yeah. By all means, please share your screen here. Yeah. Share screen to show this. Uh, bear with me for a second. Okay. okay. Is this working? I got okay. it. Okay. okay. As I said, so you've got Julian and Grandmere, and they're having this, um, this FaceTime call. And then when you're in the book, so notice, if you will, on pages 12 and 13, which I'm showing you, there's just a lot of voiceover. There's a lot of exposition. Huh. And it works in a graphic novel because you're seeing stuff. But if you read a book that just had this on the page, you would be a little, you know, you'd want there to be more kind of fleshing out of these characters and of their interactions. That's really interesting. So exposition, which we're always told in, in prose novels to basically try to avoid as much as possible. And a graphic novel isn't the same problem. That, I've never really thought of that before. It's like an info dump is yeah. okay. You know, exactly. like vis there's a visual context to it, but not as much if it's purely text. Right. Huh. You can, um, you know, it works very well for this kind of thing because it provides, and look at this, this is just a two page spread, but you get so much background information and you get a real setting of the stage. You see their town, you see their house, you see their landscape. You get all that stuff in two pages and all this background information. So it sort of, 
it's very, very, as I, I keep saying, immersive. That's the word that comes to mind for me. But if you looked at these words on the page with no images, you would say, okay, that's too much exposition. This doesn't feel like a novel. Yeah. Um, so what did you and, do? Well, so I tried to create scenes. I tried to build scenes off of this information. I tried to, it's sort of, you know, it, it's almost like a, a, a sort of a funny analogy, but you know how sometimes if, you, if you're watching one of those like QVC type channels where they're like, it's a bracelet, it goes around your wrist, it, you know, like they, they use every piece of information that is provided to you in talking about the thing. And so I try to study these images and say, what's going on here? Like, what's what am I learning from these pictures and what can I use to build a scene? You know, just the little mother and father lifting their daughter up and playing a little like one, two, three, we the first mm -hmm. two pages. Like, how do I build a scene of them going to town and what information can I share through that scene about so their relationship? Really, yeah, yeah, you're reading into the visual images more than anybody else ever has. I know this book really well. And I and I paid a lot of attention to you know what's on their walls, what's going on, you know, like all that stuff. You have to sort of drink up because otherwise, I felt it's not that I didn't add anything of my own to it, but I didn't want to deviate from what you know. I mean, she worked very hard to create this thing, and I wanted to to lift it up. You and you didn't want to deconstruct it, basically. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. I didn't feel like it was. It what was, if it wasn't set in that country? No, no, no. Exactly. <laughs> we transported this to another planet. Exactly. Yeah. No. So, um, no. so the other the other thing I was going to say that was sort of um, that was sort of interesting that I discovered in working on the book. This is a very painful scene in the book where, um, where the there's um, they're trying to escape from the school and the, the person of the, the resistance who is trying to lead them away is killed, um, kind of barely out of view of a bunch of children who are being captured by the Nazis. And this is all seen by the protagonist, and it's a really brutal image. And I realized that one of the one of the, you know, fortuitous things about writing it in prose. I mean, I still included the scene with a lot of detail, but for any reader who might, you know, just pull away from the book because the image is too graphic for them, um, a book that's written entirely in prose presents it differently, and it enables the reader to sort of imagine it in their head, which can make it worse or better depending on your reader, obviously. But I thought it was sort of interesting. So for anybody who might, you know, shield children from this book because of this page, I feel like writing it in prose gave me an opportunity to write it in a way that it could just bring in a larger readership to this story. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, one of the objections always to graphic novels is that if you have an act of violence, mm -hmm. seeing it is so much different than hearing about it, like written on the page. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's why, to some extent, adults have always sort of objected to comics and graphic novels because the image is there in your face, whereas it goes through some layer in filtering if it's just words. So you've kind of gone the opposite direction where it, it was such a brutal image to begin with and you had to turn it into a prose narrative. Yeah, and as I said, I, don't, I, I certainly didn't want to take it out by all means, but I also wanted to find a way to, to share it so that you don't, you know, because it, it does spare you the looking at this image and not being, you know, having it kind of ingrained in your head. So, mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was kind of an interesting opportunity in it. Well, Other and just to, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no go, go ahead, Betsy. Okay. Just a real quick thing, because this reminds me of uh, another question I had for you. So, of course, there's a real debate about when we are teaching kids about, um, slavery, when we're teaching kids about the Holocaust, when we're dealing with these really heavy topics, how the question of how much you teach at what age, um, what do you show, what do you not show, that's really, it's really contentious. People have very distinct ideas on, on different things. Some people are like, no, show them everything. And other people are like, uh, no, don't show the kindergartner <laughs> um, the gas camps, please. So um, how for you, because I know that uh, the, in the original book, certain decisions were made already, but you had to make decisions as well uh, when adapting this into a prose novel. So how did you handle that? How'd you tackle it? Yeah. I mean, as I said, I, try, I tried as much as I could to respect the decisions that had made, been made you know, already. So I did not take out anything that happened. I included every, every action that happened in the book. Um, and a lot of detail. As I said, I don't, I, I don't believe that you know, I think kids should see that horrible things like this happened. Um, I think it's important to know 
that aspect of the Holocaust, to not kind of pretty it up or clean it up in any way. Um, that said, this is a book in which the, the you know the the action and the violence are fairly isolated. There's a lot about this book that tells a different story about um, seeing the good in people and about you know all those who helped during the Holocaust. Um, but I you know I wanted to make sure that there was a balanced portrayal so that you you know you didn't mistakenly think you weren't in a Holocaust book. This is you know this right. is this happened and this needed to stay in. Mm -hmm. um, but writing about it is different. As I said, the way in which I described it, the way in which I, I talked about the emotions, you know, the, the reaction that this provokes in Sarah, who's the protagonist, who sees this from a hiding place and knows that she can't call out and warn her classmates and, and friends. You know, I really sort of tried to grapple with the emotional content of it. Yeah. So I thought that was an, an opportunity that it presented to kind of to have the violence happen but to also talk about what the violence, what resulted from it, what flowed from that. Yeah. Okay. Um, another thing, but this actually relates to what you just were asking about in terms of choices and in terms of what you present to children. One of the really fascinating things for me about the book was that there is magical realism in the book. Um, <clears throat> and the magical realism, so the page I've just flipped to is a moment in which, so there's a, there's a motif of birds, white birds, um, throughout the book. And it comes in a variety of different ways, but there are these moments when Sarah is transported by the birds, kind of almost becomes a bird. Like it's very, it's beautifully done in the book, as you can see in this image. Um, but it's it's vague. It's not. It leaves it up to the viewer, uh, the reader, to determine what's actually happening. You know, one reader, a younger, you know, a younger reader or a reader with more of a kind of a greater imagination might say she's flying with the birds. Another reader might say she is imagining that she can transcend her circumstances. And anything, you know, I'm sure there's a million other explanations for this and other images like this. Um, but when you don't have the pictures, it's really hard to figure out a way to, to keep that feeling in the novel without putting a finger on what's actually going on. Um, and I wanted, I really wanted to leave it, here's another situation. So in this one, um, Sarah is looking out a window and she closes her eyes and she sort of flies. Her, her, and it's able to see actual events that she can't see from her vantage point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really hard to write. How did you tackle that? Right. So this is the kind of stuff that was, this is why I really- You have to decide if it's real or not, essentially. My gosh. And I struggled with this project because I didn't want to tell a child, this is what's happening. She's at the window and she's imagining that she can see such and such, which she can't actually see. I don't, that doesn't help the story. So basically you had to do the ending of the giver. <laughs> uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's not, I, it open. Yeah. I signed on, there were a couple of things I didn't think about and that was definitely one of them. I was like, wow, how am I gonna do this? And I hope I did it just as I did the best I could. Um, I really tried to write it in such a way that a, different readers could take different things away from it. That some readers would absolutely go with her and think that she had just blown out the window with the bird. And other readers would say that she is, she wants so badly to be there um, that she kind of mentally projects herself, dreams, imagines, you tell me what is happening. Um, but there are actually so happening. Yeah. So you need to get the information actually conveyed. So this is the kind of thing I struggled with: is how to convey information accurately that she might not actually know, given the limits of time and space. This process is so interesting to me because I have talked to pretty much nobody who's ever adapted a comic into a novel. Well, so uh, I, that was the other thing: is I tried to find someone who had done this already. I yeah. really really did, because I, I just went into this, usually when I'm trying to do something new, I've written a, got books a lot of different ways, I've written plays, I've written, you know, picture books. I've also, you know, when I've struggled with a picture book, I've tried to make it into a chapter book and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I'm oh, very open to the idea of telling stories different ways, but I really hoped I could find someone who had done this, who would say, oh yeah, do this. And if that person is out there, I have not found <laughs> No, 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 no. I, I mean, I'm racking my brain right now. We've seen a million novels turned into graphic novels. That's not even, that's not, I mean, that's, it's so common as to be boring. Yeah. But the comic with, now this, 
in a way, this really speaks well to the state of graphic novels today, that you yeah. can have quality comics that are so good that people want to see them in multiple formats, including novels, um, in a, I'm like, in a way, now I was going to say, is this like when you adapt something to a film, but not really? Because again, you've got the visual element that you can lean on. You can't lean on the visual elements anymore. <laughs> and you got to make them all wordy and junk. Um, I, yeah. And I'm wondering now, like if White Bird, this book, is being adapted into a film and they want to make it into a novel to accompany that, surely that's going to happen again. And it just blows my mind. I'm like, okay, well, New Kid by Jerry Kraft. What if they want right. to turn that into like a, a Netflix TV movie and then they want to have a prose book that goes with it? Again, you've got these magical realism visual elements that would be... Poof. They can give me a call. I'm the go-to. You're now the go-to person. Right, exactly, for this. So I, I'm turning to the next page just to show you just the kind of thing that, like, I, this is a little excerpt. This is not final, just to be clear. Um, I just pulled it out of my out of a draft just to show the kind of things that I tried to do in taking it. This is actually working from a scene that's very scene-like. It lent itself um, to the to structuring it as a narrative. But this kind of work was what was involved, was taking taking what was on the page and trying to build it into something that stood on its own as a scene, um, including the ones that had, as I said, magical elements. This is a less magical element. Um, it's, it's just a, you know, it's a schoolyard confrontation. I mean, I'm page. impressed with how much of your own personal ego you have to take out of this process because you know, I look at this and I'm like, oh yeah, this would be fun to adapt. But then I'm thinking like, and you could put all these creative elements and like different things into it. And I'm like, but if you're trying to be doing what the author originally intended with the graphic novel, you kind of have to take yourself out of it to a certain degree. And that's really hard to do. Yeah. I mean, I still, as I said, I still felt like I got a lot of, I mean, I was, as I said, they were, you know, Raquel and, and Aaron were both very, very um, generous and supportive of my work. And I felt like I had a lot of opportunity for creativity just in terms of interpreting things like the magical realism. Um, and figuring out ways to kind of move. Sometimes I had to move information around in time. It was almost like a logic problem because <laughs> I'd have to move information around to figure out how to convey it in a way that would work with the book. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not exactly at the moment it happened in the book or from the source in the book. Um, or I'd have to, sometimes in the book, um, in, through voiceover, we would learn that, you know, Sarah would say, I learned later that such and such, but she wouldn't attribute where she had learned that. So trying to figure out where might she have learned that so that that could be shared either by Grand Mare or in, by some other character in the story. So it took a little detective work and, and a lot of creativity. Um, while, as you say, I was sort of limited to the, the four the four walls of the book. And, yeah. and the other thing I want to say is that I, you know, I never, I still haven't seen any of the movie. The movie is coming out um, this fall, I think in October. Uh, I'm dying to see it. I think they probably took some liberties and changed some things um, as so well. You haven't seen the script I of seen the script. film, which is a whole third yeah, take. Exactly. exactly. Oh, wow. There's someone doing something similar to what you're doing, but uh, but in another format entirely. This is fascinating. Right. What's yeah, the, the picture book version? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's all, yeah, it's true. There are all these different people who have sort of touched the story in different ways. And there's a, there's a, th a through line of all of it, but each one is going to be a little bit different. And I hope that nobody who reads the, you know, the version that I worked on says, oh, you know, this, they didn't get this part right, or they didn't, you know, it, it's well, possible. Probably, I mean, if I can harbor a guess, what's probably going to happen is that in like a couple of years from now, people are going to assume that your book was the first that the graphic novel was second and that the film came third. And then inevitably there will be a stage play. It's um, my book and everything else were really really different. Different. around the book. It's her story. And I was, you know, happy to be joining her in it. Um, and so you're right. And they may think that she wrote that first yeah. along with me and then adapted in that way because it's, that is the usual way of doing things, the usual order of things. But you're right. I, I think it is kind of a cool opportunity to take a visual story and try to figure out how to tell it with just words. It's sort of a little like having one hand behind your back, but it's also like you get to do things that you wouldn't have done otherwise. So. 
Then we'll have the novelization of the movie, which right. will be a different. Right. Kind of yeah, so that's a thing that exists. Like that's certainly a, for a long time there have been novelized versions of movies, yeah. but it's sort of a different animal, you know. But it's kind of a version of what you've just done in a way. It's taking a visual narrative with a script and then yeah. turning it into a prose novel. And why instantly my head goes to Willow the novel. Why, Brain? Why would that be the thing that you would? I'm like, you know, like Willow the novel or the yeah. E.T. We all remember that. No, we don't, Betsy. What are you talking about? Okay. <laughs> the standard bearers. After yeah, all. exactly. So why, I mean, you meant you touched on this a little bit at the beginning, but um, was there any reason why why you were brought into the project in particular? Um, why didn't she just adapt her own book? I, I mean, I assume it was in part because of constraints of time and space. You know, she had, um, her book Pony came out last summer, which is when we were working on this. And I think she was working on that. I assume she was also working on another book that we'll, we'll learn about later. So she had a busy docket. And so I think that was, Part of the reason, um, I you know I had a background in writing Jew writing and telling Jewish stories that Erin knew about, so, so I think that was you know why she maybe if she knew she needed a writer she turned to me, mm -hmm. um, you know and I also I, I had never I've never set out I've never done any historical fiction before this that I can think of um, oh. I've never um, uh, written a Holocaust story and I had no plan to do that because I had always read and heard and believed that while it is really important to keep the Holocaust alive and to share those stories, um, there's so much Holocaust literature out there that it drowns out everything else in terms of telling kids about the Jewish experience. And so I've always gravitated towards telling realistic fiction, contemporary fiction. Like I, I didn't think that I had a Holocaust story that I needed to tell. But it was so exciting to get the chance to take a story that I already knew and loved about the Holocaust and become part of it. Yeah, and if I can just do a hat tip to your books, what I like about your books so much is that they are contemporary Jewish kids in books, which for a while there, it's getting a little more common now, but for a while there, you know, someone once told me, they were like, if I was an alien from outer space and I landed in a children's room, I would be convinced that all Jewish people were gone after World War II because you get the Holocaust narratives and then they're not in any casual books anymore. Right. Um, your books have always been so good about just having kids doing their stuff, living their lives, and they're funny, which is so important. Thank so. you. I, those, I mean, that's those are stories that I gravitate towards. And so, um, so thank you. That, that's that's what I do, spend most of my time doing. But then I occasionally I get sucked into a project like this, and it's just impossible to refuse. Oh yeah, <laughs> they made you an <laughs> offer you couldn't refuse. <laughs> story like Sarah is a great character and I really enjoyed telling her story because she's not just like this little you know victim um mm -hmm. she's definitely you know she's standing on around two feet trying to figure stuff out and so it was fun to get a chance to do it. and also like it's just something that I don't usually do so I like I like people who are willing to give you a chance to try something new so. yeah I get that now did you have any contact with the um the illustrator at all with the illustrator of, no, of the original graphic novel? No, so that, so that that's Raquel. She did the whole thing. Yeah. Oh, she did. Yeah. Um, no, not knowing that fact. Man. No, the book I didn't is. realize that. Oh, well, then that changes everything. Of course, you'd be looking at the details because that's from the author herself. Yeah, she's a, she's a bit of a triple threat. Um, she's very, very talented. I knew this at one point in my, in my history, and now I'm just. But, uh, Kevin Zapp, I assume I'm pronouncing this wrong, probably, but the, that per, that person who inked these beautiful things. Yeah, the inking so, and the coloring probably were done by somebody else, but yeah. yeah. Well, not, I never had any contact with him or them. No, or, no, no. Um, but since okay. Rachel created so much of the imagery as well as the um, words, she was my go-to for all sorts of stuff. And okay, she, well, I'm glad we made it clear that she did the, the art as well, because I think some people who, like myself, haven't seen it in a couple of years. Yeah. Um, that, but. She also, I mean, she sent me a box of her books that she used as reference material, and so I was able to use the same sources when I was going through and trying to figure stuff out, so that was amazing. Um, I also, since I live in D.C., I was able to go to the Holocaust Museum and do a little bit of research on my own just to sort of fill in gaps, so that was okay. nice. So I felt like I had I had good support in all, in all categories. 
And also like there were moments, and this was even in the copy editing stage where we would try struggle over some random detail of the book and we would often go back to her just about, you know, mm -hmm. is this, you know, is this in this part, does everybody go up to the attic or are they all in the, in the base of the barn? Like what's going on? Because sometimes it's not entirely clear from the picture. Right. But, no, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Well, I just have to say, I'm so impressed. What, do you know when the book is coming out? Yes, the book. Okay, so the new White Bird, a novel, which is the one that I got to work on, is coming out at the end of, of August. Great. So I think it's August 30th is the pub date in advance of the movie, which comes out in October, I believe. And, and other, where will the movie be coming out? Do you know? Movie, so the movie is going to be like everywhere. It's got big people like Helen Mirren and... Um, Yes, I guess she is a, a famous actress lady. And Gillian Anderson. Is also oh. there, which I'm super psyched about. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Apologies to Helen Mirren, where I was like, Helen Mirren, yes, of course. Yeah. Gillian Anderson, what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was the other exciting thing was the, the cover, which I am not allowed to show you, but which will be public very soon because I think there's a trailer they're going to um, share and the cover and stuff so keep an eye out for this because it will be coming the cover is gorgeous it features the two kids who play um sarah and julian in the book in the movie on the cover it's really beautiful um and i'm super psyched because my picture and julian anderson's picture are only a couple of inches apart like i'm sort of standing next to her in a way if you you know like yeah yeah if you kind of like squint that sort of like we're at a party and we're going to talk to each other soon yeah. I recognize you from the book jacket, you might say. Exactly. Remember when we were having that? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, and I think that what you're doing here is kind of groundbreaking. There are larger applications uh, at work here. This is not the last time we're going to see a comic adapted into a novel. Uh, and I hope I, not. I think there are great opportunities for telling stories this way. So. Yeah. The more stories, the better. Um, as I would think. And uh, and now everyone who does it will now have you as a reference to go to because you did it. And you may not have been the first, but you kind of were the first. So yeah, yeah I, I don't know that as a, I don't know for a fact that I was, but I, I'm happy, as I said, if anyone else wants to do this, come talk to me because I will talk <laughs> all day long. I appreciate you giving me a little time to talk about it, Betsy, because I love talking about it. There's it was such a cool process. Well, and I can see writing teachers all over the country right now being like, ooh, we could make this a writing assignment and have kids adapt graphic novels into prose novels. Hmm. I think so. it would be great, because I also think that's a great message to give to kids, is that there's, yeah. there isn't just one way of telling a story. The same way that we tell kids, you know, okay, so, you know, you don't want to write this thing, try drawing it, and see if you can, you know, get the ideas out. Like, why not take something that you love that's a comic and try to figure out how you would tell that story a different way? Perfectly said. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me here today and telling me all about your upcoming book. And uh, I cannot wait to see the adaptation. Uh, thank you. I'm very excited to share it with you and with everyone one of these days soon. All right. Have a great day. Okay, thanks. You too. Bye, everybody.